All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Vinny Francio. I am a second year resident at the University of Kansas Medical Center in Kansas City. And uh, one of the uh, individuals behind PMNR Scholars. And uh, it's our pleasure today to have Dr. Michael Furman. Uh, he is going to be our speaker. And he is the author of one of my favorite books right here. Fantastic book. Um, and uh, just a brief introduction about uh, Dr. Furman, he went to Medical School Temple University, uh, uh, Residency at Temple, Fellowship at Interventional Pain, Georgia Spine and Sports. He is the fellow, Interventional Spine and uh, uh, Interventional Spine Fellowship Director at um, Orthopedic uh, Spine and Sports uh, in Pennsylvania. And like I mentioned, one of my favorite books and uh, just overall a fantastic uh, professor and teacher. I've been, um, had the honor to see some of his uh, uh, Zoom lectures and it was excellent even early in the morning. Uh, but uh, it's just an honor to have him uh, present uh, to us some of his uh, clinical pearls. Thank you, Dr. Furman, go ahead. All right, <clears throat> first let me make sure I can uh, share my screen. Um, and um, let me start it up here. And I'd like to make sure you should all see that my cursor moving over the title slide. You guys see that? Uh, okay. So. Uh, yes, we do. We do. Okay. Thank you. I just just give me a little feedback in the beginning, just telling me if the slides are moving when they when they when they're supposed to. Yes, you bet, sir. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, so, this is a tough situation because usually when I lecture to residents and, and, and students, I love querying them beforehand and asking all these questions and get a feel for where everyone's at. And I, uh, I really do enjoy lecturing. And, and what I've been fortunate is um, <clears throat> a couple of years ago, I won, I've won a few awards for my lectures. And uh, I, it's most fun for me when I uh, get, a, get an award that's a lectureship award, because then it forces me to uh, really put some time into making like a, a really stellar lecture instead of just a routine lecture. And uh, I've had that opportunity a couple of times in my life and I'm very blessed to have that. Um, this uh, lecture here uh, was when I won the award from the Academy of PM&R, uh, the Passover Legacy Award. And I've repurposed it for you guys and I've added some other fun stuff. So um, it may sound a little bit like an award talk, but I'm gonna try to make it more like a pearls talk and how I got where I am. So I can share with you guys uh, how I got where I am. And I'm hoping that if I can inspire just one of you guys to, to do more and contribute more and get more out of what we have as a field, then I feel I've, I've achieved something. I really want to make sure I also entertain you. So I put a few, I'd like to make this fun. So I, I would say since it's late at night for anybody who wants to get an adult beverage, uh, if you're over 21, of course, uh, you're welcome to do so because I will try to make this an enjoyable lecture for you. So, of course, the title might intrigue you. It, I hope it does. That was the goal, is the answer to most clinical questions. Um, so before I go on, like all lectures, I have to talk about some disclosures. Um, I uh, do lecture for SIS. Um, I'm a shareholder in my office in, my, my, in York, Pennsylvania, and I get royalties for that red book that Vinny showed you, but also we have a newer version. It's a blue book, and I'll talk about, a lot about that in this lecture and what drives me to make that book. Um, so the answer to most clinical questions, the answer, are the slides advancing there, Vinny or somebody? Are the slides advancing? Yes, they are. Oh, good, good. That, that makes it a lot better for me. So the answer to most clinical questions is actually, we'll jump right to it because some of you guys probably just logged in here to find out what the answer was so they can leave. So I'm gonna get right to that answer very quickly. The answer to most clinical questions is not unlike the answer that people seek when they climb a large mountains and try to find some person on the top of the mountain to give them that answer. And they get up to the top of the mountain and they see this man uh, meditating and they go over to him and they say, do you have the answer? And he looks at them and he says, actually, let me change the slide here. It's the same answer that many 
Talmudic Jewish scholars or other scholars sit around and they, they, they pontificate and they talk and talk and they ask each other questions and they, they, they try to come up with the answer and they get to it. They get to the answer. It's the same answer that I'll share with you. Um, and one of my fellows made me this, uh, this slide, uh, this picture, it's in my office. Uh, for those who speak Japanese, that means sensei. And he gave that to me, me teacher in, 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 in Japanese. And, and, and he thinks I have all the answers. So I, I think I should at least answer, tell you what the answer to most clinical questions is. And actually, my recent fellow made another one similar to that. And that means guru. He thinks I'm a guru. He doesn't, I'm not really a guru. I don't insinuate that I am. But that answer to most clinical questions. And then one of my fellows made me this little uh, eight ball. I don't know if you guys remember it, but when I was a kid, we would shake this eight ball and then we'd ask it a question. And she made it so that when I shook the eight ball, it gave me that answer because she knows what my answer is. And the answer I'm gonna tell you all to most clinical questions is, uh, it depends. That is the answer, it depends. And that's, if you wanna leave now and are groaning right now, uh, that is the answer. And if you wanna uh, uh, leave now, you can, that is the answer. But I'm gonna explain to you why it's such an important answer and why I bring it up many a time. I do need to share with you that uh, you guys should really avoid this in all parts of your life, especially in medicine. Avoid the words always or never. So you can't say I never say, say I rarely say, or I frequently say, but I rarely say always or never, except if I'm using it in this sentence here. And I'm gonna to try to explain why all that comes into place as well. So the objectives of my lecture today is to, again, hello, introduce myself. I'd like to share what motivates me. I'd like to attempt to answer the clinical and other questions that may come up, but I think you know the answer already. I'd like to describe how these clinical questions are related to musculoskeletal care. I want to discuss the evolution of spine and musculoskeletal care that I have seen in my short lifetime in our field. I'd like to summarize some of the research into these and other clinical questions that I've been personally involved in and what motivated me to do them, answer, ask and answer the questions. I'd perhaps try to identify some future trends in spine and musculoskeletal medicine. And if we have time at the end, I made a few pearl slides, life pearl slides that I just kind of put together that are fun to play with. And if you can make it to the end, I will share them. So, the old question from Talking Heads, once in a lifetime. And you may ask yourself, well, how did I get here? Experience, I do need to define experience, I'll do that later, but my mentors um, have taught me a lot. As that famous line from Isaac Newton, if I see further, it's by standing on the shoulder of giants. And um, everything I have built on is because of my mentors. So I wanna share my experiences, my mentors, and my passions. And I will briefly go through some of my mentors if I could do this. Uh, that's my, my dad and my parents have always taught me to have a positive attitude and to value education and humor. And uh, my father still is within me. He, he passed away several years ago, as did my mom. And this is my mom in Hawaii teaching my girls to hula dance. Uh, my girls that are in this picture uh, when I was in Hawaii getting an award, uh, they were a lot younger then, but I'm 20, they're 24 now. Those are my girls there. Uh, anyway, they're twins. So what I've learned from my mentors, um, I was a chem chemistry major in, in college, uh, ke chemical engineering in college, but my high school teacher uh, is the one who inspired me to go into chemistry and he taught me to remain as logical as I can. And I try, and you have to have a logical approach to, to learning. When I was in, uh, Undergraduate, my, um, my mentor was Dr. Glant. And whenever I would try to debate about something, about what I should do, which job I should take, and which master's program I should look at, uh, he kind of emphasized the important thing is do the right thing. And when in doubt, that's, that's, that, that's an important one. And then I went on and got my master's at Cornell, by the way. And I've done karate. For those out there, I've um, done Shotokan karate. And um, I did eventually get my first degree black belt and I learned once I got my first degree black belt 
and I say this to my fellows, that starts the journey. I tell my fellows that when they go to my program, they get their first degree black belt. And when they go out into the real world, they're gonna get second and third degrees on their own life experiences. And uh, the trick is to make sure you remember that attaining a black belt starts your new journey. It's not the end of the journey. Uh, Dr. Mayer over at Temple, for those of you at Temple, um, taught me a great lesson because when I was, uh, I, I worked with him doing research as a, as a medical student and then worked with him as a resident. And we did a lot of functional cool things with him. And uh, I remember him asking me once how my, re my rotations were going and I told him about a really not so great rotation I was on. And he said, well then why? And he, I told him why it wasn't a great rotation. And he said, well then you learned a lot because you can learn as much from the bad people as the good and you can promise yourself you're not gonna be that kind of teacher and you're not gonna be that kind of doctor. And if you learn, so you can learn from the bad people as well as the good, remember that. Um, there's my residency class. So I too was a resident, that's me over there. You can see my, Mercer, my cursor moving right now, Vinny? Yes, okay. we can, yeah. sir, yes. Yeah. So that, that's me, by the way, uh, and that's my, my residency class. So I too was a resident at one point. Now, when I was a resident, I got really involved with the Resident Physician Council, uh, which is now called, I think, the um, Physiatry and Training Council of the Academy, PHIT. Um, and that's, that's me there. Uh, and I was eventually became what was then called the chair and I was the president of the Resident Physician Council. And there's a lot of, uh, some famous people in this picture, which I just don't want to do and go rattle through them all. But the reality is um, there's some residency directors and some great researchers that were just residents when I was uh, a student. Uh, a resident. And um, so this is my point here to share with all of you is get involved. Because if you get involved with things, the more you put in, the more you get out of everything. And don't just join things to join them. Join them because you want to contribute. And the more you put in, the more you'll get out. And I have to give credit to this whole PMR Scholars Program because what I find is fascinating about all these different groups is that the, there's, a, there's, a, there's somewhat of a stranglehold in some of these groups. And you'll, you'll find that when you try to get involved, you may find yourself hitting a ceiling. But I think that the, the internet and, and, and Zoom and all these, uh, and social media has changed things. So you can get involved with lots of stuff. You don't have to only go through these major organizations. And you can really network. Uh, and I give this PMR Scholars Group a lot of credit because they're doing that outside of the usual way but just get involved meet people and uh, the more you meet the more fun you'll have the more fun you have the more you'll learn and the more you learn the more the cycle i just stated repeats um i was quite active in the password i'm sure i don't know if you've heard about it it was the physiatric association of spine and sports rehab it doesn't exist it's very fascinating when i was on the resident physician council i was actually uh sitting on the board of the academy when, when Passor started 30 years ago, over 30 years ago. Um, and uh, anyway, just uh, that, that was fascinating. And then I actually, as a resident, as a ch chair of the Resident Physician Council, I got to sit on the, RP, on the Academy Board of Governors. And um, it was really funny. I, I, when they were taking picture of the Academy Board, I, 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 I wasn't supposed to get in this picture, but I, I jumped into it. And they're like, I, I don't know if you're supposed to be in this picture, but I, I kind of stood there anyway. And I told every future RPC chair to make sure they get in the picture. And we started a new tr tradition at that point. So I thought that was, so push the envelope a little bit, you know, why not? Um, anyway, um, my, my mentor, my fellowship, he was the one who told me we should push the envelope. Back when I did my fellowship, we didn't even, he was one of the first physiatrists to put stimulators in people and that blew people away. So again, push the envelope. We can make a difference if we do it. And as I said, I was quite active in the academy and password. I eventually got on the actual academy bo board. And I learned some great lessons from being on it. Number one is they have a lot of strategic planning sessions. And I learned about vision and strategic pl planning. And I'll talk a lot about vision tonight. But the key thing is you have to, whenever you go to these strategic planning, it sounds boring, but it's actually quite cool to, to put together visions and, and strategize. But the other thing I learned when I was on there, that group is a smile and nod. And that's an expression you need to always know, smile and nod. Because whether you, um, I, I learned it actually from people at the academy. I remember I once was giving a lecture and I, I forgot my 
I forgot something. I forgot what it was. And I, I went over last minute and I had to replace my slides and I went over and she kindly uh, switched my slides and I said, I'm surprised you're not really super pissed at me because I, you told us to have it ready earlier and she smiled and nodded at me and she goes, Dr. Furman, I just smile and nod. And that was, I thought about that and I saw I used that a lot. So don't forget that one. That's an important one. Um, this is me. I was, I created one of the first Academy and Passover uh, spinal uh, injection workshops back in the day when I had darker hair. And that's just a picture of me doing that. And um, so that was the beginning of my interest in teaching. And I realized that the more you teach, the more you learn. And so I do want to share with you that uh, if you really want to learn something well, teach it. Um, so, and Frank Falco was one of my colleagues from Temple. Uh, he was a, a year ahead of me or so. And he, he actually had his fellowship for a while and he's now retired. But he, he always taught me that you can always have fun while you're working. And, and whenever I co-taught it, courses with him, you knew the table with the laughter was Frank's. And uh, so it's really important that you have fun when you, when you teach and work. Um, and there's many famous interventionalists that I've been, had the pleasure of working with. And all of them have taught me that you have to have, uh, always make sure you're working on good technique, the right technique, and, and understand the research behind what we do and contribute when the, you feel the research uh, is not necessarily uh, where you think it should be. Um, and what is interesting, bringing up the Passover again, is the Passover, I couldn't believe it. Uh, when I was on the Passover board, um, we were talking about dissolving Passover because our goal was to make, uh, we, we said, what is Passover? We, our goal was to make musculoskeletal medicine part of the academy. And we said we would eventually dissolve Passover if we achieved that. And that was very controversial at the time because there were a lot of lovers. And to this day, people don't know why we, did, why we integrated uh, Passover into the academy. And that's because the academy had become, everything about the academy had become very musculoskeletal oriented. And um, Passover integrated with the academy in 2008. And I was on the board at the time. And that was a very controversial time. Uh, here's a picture of me when I was on the Passover board. Um, you may recognize, uh, this is Larry Frank, this is uh, Jerry Malenga, who's very, who's, Bill Moshe was a past, he eventually became president of the Academy. You all heard of Jay Smith over at Mayo, that's Dave Bagnell, he eventually became president of the Academy. Stu Weinstein was the editor-in-chief, uh, and then there's me. Um, anyway, and this is me when I was on the Academy board, um, and uh, this is in Hawaii, uh, when I also got an award. Uh, the Rosenthal Award, and uh, that's, anyway, and that's me. I got my award, and of course, my daughters are holding the, these are my daughters, that's their friend who came over, that they came to Hawaii and saw me get the award. So I would also add, if you ever are lucky enough to get an award, um, you know, I, I brought my, my wife, of course, but my parents, uh, that's the greatest joy for a parent is to be there when you get an award. Um, needless to say, uh, my sister's, my sister was there and of course my children and I feel very blessed that they got to see their dad get an award because, you know, they, they think I know something then. Who knows, you know. So um, getting back into it, uh, I, I'm thanking everybody, that, especially my current staff, uh, the OSS Health staff who have a great attitude and team approach and my current partners who've taught me uh, humility and patience uh, to be succinct. Um, They've also taught me about the four pillars of health, which I'll mention later in my lecture. Um, and um, I realized that you also have to realize, as I was doing this lecture, one of my, I practiced this lecture decades ago when another lecture, and one of my staff came over and said, you should thank your patients. And I had to think about it. It's true because we have to thank our patients. And what I want to add, what I have learned from my patients is that we have to do the care with their paradigm, not ours. So let me repeat that. The care that we give our patients has to be within their paradigm and not ours. So that means when you're going to a patient and you say, I think you need this and need that, you're gonna get half, well, in York County, you'll get patients who just want me to do what I want, and that's fine. But you're also gonna get those patients that don't wanna do an injection, or they don't wanna do medications, and they wanna do more conservative care. But then there's those that don't want to do the PT and want to go right. So you have to kind of 
change your plan based on what they want and not what you want. And my patients have taught me humility. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, I've gotten my share of letters of people complaining about me. Um, so I um, want to let you know you will get those letters, no matter how good you think you are and no matter how uh, humble you think you are and how much you try to answer the questions and read them and don't walk away and say, oh, they're, uh, and come up with some name of what they are. You have to look at it and sit back and say, okay, I can learn from this and realize that you can change and learn when someone offers you advice. And so what I've also learned from my fellows and my daughters, uh, when I was teaching my daughter to drive, uh, she kept saying, I know, I know, I know. And instead I said, instead of saying, I know, every time you're dying to say, you know, and I say this to my fellows, don't say, you know, say, thank you. It, make, it kills you to do it. I'm going to warn you. But when your attending says, don't forget to do this or don't forget to do that. You're dying to say, I know, I know, I know, but we don't want to hear. I know to smile, nod and say, thank you. And so when my daughter was learning to drive and I would scream at her, avoid that car, avoid that car, she would grit her teeth and look at me with a very sarcastic look and say, thank you. So work on that guys. And that will help you going through life too. Um, so I've also learned from past and current fellows. Uh, one of the other reasons I love having a fellowship is I keep learning because what I'm doing now is so different from what I did 15, 20 years ago. And that's because you fellows keep coming through and teaching more and more stuff. Um, I learned from the famous movie, Catch Me If You Can. That was a great scene where he, uh, a guy who's not a doctor pretends he's a doctor um, and he's in the ER and he doesn't know what the heck to do because he's not really a doctor and he looks at the resident who they think he's a doctor and he goes, what should I do? And they, what would you do? He says to them and they tell him what they would do. And he says, oh, I concur. Do that, do that. So that's what I do. And I don't know what to do. I ask my fellows what to do. And I say, I concur. So that's a great, that helps me a lot. And there's uh, our staff with um, a couple of years ago, and there's my current partners in the front, some of them. Uh, anyway, these are way old pictures of fellows. These are my first fellows. And through the years, uh, all the fellows uh, and uh, in the office um, and staff. And uh, that's the other reason, it's fun, it's fun to have a fellowship and to keep staying young with these folks, you know? So a couple of years ago, back into back, back six years ago, we started a course every other year for my past fellows and whoever and current and current future and past fellows. We did our first course in Puerto Rico. And uh, this is uh, our, our first group picture. And we actually did an ultrasound out on the balcony. Uh, and I decided, as we said, that, that was the uh, best ultrasound course ever, because how often are you outside with palm trees behind you when you're learning ultrasound? So we made that a tradition. So every other year we have this course, and in 16 we were in Salt Lake City, and that is a very cold picture. We're freezing when we took this picture. This is a snowbird. But we actually, this is a real old picture, and it is not, I repeat, it is not Photoshop. We went out in the balcony, and we again recreated the picture. Ultrasound and uh, went to uh, Tucson and had a course. Uh, and um, we again kept our simulation. We brought our ultrasound up to the waterfall and took this picture. And uh, so, that's as you can see, it's all about having fun and education all at the same time. Um, and then, just this year, pre COVID, are we lucky or what? We were in Jekyll Island uh, in Georgia, and there's our group shot that we all took. And there's our uh, ultrasound picture by the, by the ocean. Uh, so I don't think there's many pictures like that of ultrasound by the ocean. So we're going to keep this tradition up and uh, it's all for fun. Um, our, our group keeps growing. Um, this is uh, a colleague of mine um, who invited me out to uh, Turkey to lecture. So I invited him to our, like, our, our course and he, he came and joined us. So it's just been, it's just been phenomenal. Uh, the more I, more I give, the more I get, and the more I teach, the more I, my family grows, and I feel very fortunate to have such a great family. Anyway, um, so uh, 
the family, uh, family always does come first, and that's the big picture. Here's a picture of my, my wife putting up my antics in, uh, in, in New Orleans um, and uh, at one of the 2018 Academy meeting, and uh, my wife. And I want to thank her especially. And this is when I gave my, this lecture I'm giving to you right now. Uh, these are people that attended my lecture, and I, I like taking pictures of groups. So this is the people, some of the people who attended my lecture in, in, at the Academy. With some of my mentors, there's Gary Goldberg, who's one of my past fellows, John Kirshner, and all these are past fellows and friends and past residents, friends, and, and there's DJ, and there's people from the cat from SIS that I know. And anyway, so moving on. Um, repetition is good, good. That's one of my expressions I stole from one of my fellows, and one of my fellows made this for me. So repetition is good, good. All right, remember that. So there's a great book <clears throat> called Raving Fans. It's a short book. If you take nothing else from the book, it says, tell people what to expect, tell them what not to expect. It's a great expression because I think it goes for many things. Um, when I have fellows apply to my program, I tell them what to expect and they say, and, and uh, I can give examples, I won't get into that. I have patients that come in and they say, I say to them, let me tell you right now, I heard you're looking for narcotics. Uh, what, what I will promise you is I'm gonna give you the best possible care but don't expect me to write you narcotics um, long-term. And so I tell them right up what to expect and what not to expect. Um, same thing with work-related issues. I'm not gonna take you off work, but I tell them right away what not to expect. When a fellow comes to my program, I have people who have been out in practice and they say, hey, I don't need to do basic lumbar procedures. I don't need to do EMG nerve conductions. I just wanna do this and that. And I say, well, if you apply to our program, this is what you would get. This is what you won't get. And it's important to do that when you are um, in any situation, uh, in most situations, I should say, because if you don't tell people what to expect and what not to expect, you're going to have unhappy people. When I started my job in the beginning, I was told I'd be a partner. This is over 20 years ago, and it wasn't going to happen. And that created dissatisfier for me because they told me one thing and it didn't come through. So just remember, tell people what to expect, but also tell them what not to expect. You can say, well, geez, if I tell them that, they may not want to come here. Well, that would be a lot better then. But you should tell people what to expect, what not to. That's the bottom line. So when I give a lecture, I'm going to tell you what to expect here. I'm going to give you, I'm going to raise many questions and I'm going to answer many of them with the same answer and I will digress. That's my nature. I uh, tell you, I will give you a passionate discourse on spine and musculoskeletal care and the physiatric approach. And I will teach you some life skills. Life skills, my definition of life skills are things that you uh, need not just for the next day or two, but for the rest of your life. And I hope I can impart a few life skills on you. But what not to expect is all of the answer because uh, yeah, it all depends, you know? So um, what I hope is that when I, show you tonight is well i'll give you some new information or strategy i hope i can provoke you i definitely hope i entertain you and i have to warn you repetition is good good so i will be repeating things over and over and that's because repetition is good good so let's start with vision uh one of the mottos in my atlas uh is set up is key but it's not just for the atlas it's in many venues it's in our practices it's in our encounters with patients and staff other things, actually, for telling a good joke or giving a good lecture, setup is key. Um, so let's go into spine care. In spine care, we have many questions. What are the indications for different procedures? What are the pre-procedure risk prevention issues? Let's talk about techniques for safety, for efficacy, for efficiency. So let's start with indications. So modified serenity prayer. Grant me the courage and skill to aggressively treat those patients that I can improve. Give me the strength and serenity to be conservative with those I cannot and the wisdom to know the difference. I say that because some patients you can fix, some you can't. So uh, when this patient comes in right here, that's someone I'm pretty sure I can treat. And I, if I had a live audience, I would have you rattle off all the things we could do with this patient, but you all know what that is. But when this patient comes in, boy, that's a frustrating one. And that's when you have to have the wisdom to know the difference. They've been to everywhere. They've been to almost every specialty except the GI specialist. And uh, there's nothing that's going to necessarily help this patient. Even a steroid dip won't help this patient. 
but there are things we have to do and that's when you have to step back and not start injecting that patient. So of course we know that we have to evaluate our patients. You say it's a sharp stabbing pain, hmm, sharp stabbing pain. So we have to always go back to basics, which is history and exam and know where their pain is can determine what we can do for them. Um, and now one question leads to another. We'll say that a couple of times. So one question leads to another. So how do we determine the source of a patient's pain? Well, if I go back a slide, uh, I think we have an idea where this patient's pain may be coming from, if he's pointing to that region, right? But um, when I was working with Dr. Slipman many years ago, many, many years ago, we did some tests and injected discs and we saw that these are the different, this is a diagram of someone who would present with C5-6 pain if we put fluid into their C5-6 disc. So we did, this is one of our first studies there. We did a similar study uh, with Lesher et al. Um, where we, we, when we injected the hips uh, intraarticular under fluoroscopic guidance with dye, we had them draw out where their pain patterns were and this is what they came up with. And so therefore, believe it or not, all of those referral patterns came from the hip. So those are good studies to know about. I just did one recently that just published uh, two years ago, plus with my colleague and past fellow, Dr. Steve Johnson, where we uh, had them, we, as we're doing a transferaminal epidural steroid injection, we had them draw out where their pain went when we injected uh, either uh, place the needle, place, injected dye or put anesthetic. Uh, and L3, of course, we were not surprised to see it went here, but it went down the back of the leg. We were amazed, many of them did. L4, not surprising, went down the front of the thigh and leg, but it went down the back of the leg. L5, not surprising, went down the side of the leg and even into the side of the foot, but it also went down the back of the leg. And that way, when somebody uh, in the S1 almost always went only behind the back of the thigh and leg and buttocks. So therefore, when a patient says to me, the fellow says to me, he's got pain in the S1 distribution, I say, really, what do you mean by that? So just kind of, you have to rethink, this makes you rethink things. So anyway, um, so how should we determine the source of a patient's pain? And the answer to that is, by the way, it depends. Okay, so now I'm gonna tell you about my recent uh, challenge and, and real passion is risk prevention with uh, anticoagulation, antiplatelet medications. Um, I wanna tell you a quick patient presentation that should uh, give you some pause. Um, patient's family calls and says, um, we're going to be canceling uh, dad's procedure today. And I said, oh, I mean, my staff picked this up. They go, oh, you're canceling the procedure. Um, do you want to reschedule? They go, well, no, not really. He died last night. Go, oh, he died last night. And after they hang up, I say to my staff, were they in anticoagulation, by the way? And they go, oh, no, no, he stopped it. He stopped it. Well, that's what scares me. I don't want him to stop it. Because so the question that comes up with that is, this patient died waiting for a procedure for me. I never met him, but did I kill him anyway? And that's what you have to realize. People are on medications for a reason. ASRA has all these different rules about what meds we should stop. And I kind of differ with them and I'm just going to show you what I'm talking about. What we're all worried about, what I call the boogeyman, is an epidural hematoma. That's a bleed. The risk is unknown. It's estimated to occur in less than one in 150,000 undergoing epidural anesthesia. Let me repeat that sentence. Epidural anesthesia, that phrase I'm repeating, which is typically a catheter. And when we're doing epidurals, we're not doing catheter placement. And they say, again, ASRA, that maintaining anticoagulations and antiplatelets increases this risk by approximately three times. So I wrote an article with one of my past fellows uh, for the PMR journal that says, um, uh, it, was, it was a debate, one of those uh, point counterpoints, should medications be held before lumbar epidural injections? So you have to ask yourself, why is the patient receiving the medicine? These are important questions. So when your staff says, the patient's on Coumadin, should I stop it? 
Don't just say yes or no. Say, why are they on it? What is the risk of stopping it? You need to understand that. We're doctors. Is the procedure warranted? Can it be changed to decrease the risk? And what is indeed the risk of performing the procedure without holding the medication? So you have to realize there's real risks of stopping these medications. They're listed there, strokes, MIs, DVTs, PEs. They've all been reported in patients. And there's a study out by Enders, which is published, in the, and it's in the SIS guidelines, that on their end of 2740, um, when they maintained it, uh, they, they, uh, they had no hemorrhagic spinal complications in either the stop or the maintained group. No hemorrhagic complications. But they did have, uh, they did have complications that were embolic or, or thrombotic, I should say thrombotic complications, and this was their N. They had strokes, MI, stroke, and PE, but I do want to point out their data was very clean. When they maintained the stuff, they had absolutely zero complications, and I want you to remember that because I'm going to show you my data, our data, and we didn't get that clean data. Um, so we started collecting data. We did our first abstract that was submitted in 2018 uh, for SIS. The data I'm showing you now just won the award for SIS 2020 because we had more data than we did here. And I'm going to show you that now. Um, we collected data from 2009 through 17. We had a total of 63,592 patients that had, uh, were followed. And of those, 6,300 plus were taking either anticoagulant or antiplatelets. We only lost five to follow up. And um, of these, here's the breakdown, 2,300 ceased their meds, 4,000 maintained it. Um, and we did these all, all of these procedures listed here, including cervical, spinal cord stems, trans, cervical trans, lumbar trans, cervical medial branch and RF, lumbar medial branch and RF and some peripheral procedures. These, this is a busy slide. This is the procedures we did. These are the ones that stopped their medications. There was 2,322 patients that stopped and we had 18 complications in a stopping. Uh, this person had a cardiac event, stroke, TIA, stroke, death, 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 death. And this is what prompted me to do the study. So 18 people had some pretty serious complications by stopping their medication. Now, uh, in the maintain group, 24 had complications. So this is not as clean as the Enders data. Um, and notice, um, I also listed here the days post-procedure that they had these complications. We filed them for 90 days. And this is the number of days out that they had their procedure issues. So to summarize the data, out of 63,000 plus, we had no hemorrhagic. That's the boogeyman. Zero, none, nunca, no hemorrhagic in 63,000, including the 6,341 that were on anticoagulation, antiplatelet. No hemorrhagic, no epidural hematoma, they're very blunt. Okay? Um, do you guys still see my screen? Something happened here. Dr. Furman, if you could just share your screen again. If oh. you just hit this, yeah, something took it away. All right. Are we back? Yes, we're back. All right. So let me summarize again. We had no uh, clinical, uh, we had no hemorrhagic complications in, in 64,000, 63,000 patients, including the 6,300 that were followed uh, on anticoagulation, antiplatelet. Um, the relative risk ratio of stopping was here. Uh, and the thing is, this was not, in my data, one of you guys has to mute, by the way. Um, so uh, in my data, um, in my data, there was um, uh, no, this was not a significant difference. So it, it there were more, it was more risky to stop them to maintain to, and you get, because you would get the, you get the anti, um, thromb, you get thrombotic events, but it was not considered, it did not demonstrate statistical significance in the data. 
we're still analyzing data. We haven't published yet because we still have to tease it out. And I played with the data a little bit. Um, so just this, this is a summary slide of what I just told you. But what we did is we took the time and we're going to see, this is the blue is the ceased and the green is the maintained. And we're just trying to see if there's any time period that had more risk and that, that's it. We haven't published this yet and we're still working on it. But I did want to share that data with you and tell you that I want to, this data builds upon previous research and makes it think twice before you stop this medicine. So we go back to that question now. Should we maintain or stop a patient's anticoagulation, antiplatelet medication prior to a procedure? And I would say the answer is it depends. It depends, but probably not. So it, I just Dr. Told, Dr. Yeah. Furman, sorry to butt in again. If you could just hit the escape button and then go back into your presentation, we see the presenter view. So we have your, uh, like your next slide up on the screen as well. No problem, thank you for letting me know. Do you see it okay now? Yep, that's perfect, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for letting me know, I appreciate that. See, uh, another pearl is if people offer you uh, criticism, take it. Um, thank you to you guys. Uh, I'll also add, this is not a slide, but I thought about this a lot when I'm in the OR. Um, when I'm doing, uh, when I'm in the OR and the nurse says to me, did you mean, do you wanna do that? Usually they mean you don't want to do it. <laughs> so that's another thing I want to share with you. So when a nurse or someone asks you something in a questioning manner, they're usually telling you not to do that, right? So anyway, um, so I talked so far about indications for procedures and the risk prevention, which are my passions, but my real passion is techniques. And what is the right way to do all these techniques that we do uh, for safety and efficacy? Um, and how do we safely and efficiently perform these different procedures? And I'm going to take a step back and show you something that I think is cool. Think about this. Way back in the day, people had a horse and buggy. This is simulated, of course. With the advent of the motor, the buggy changed its, its, its structure. It, it first looked like a horse and buggy. As time went on, it changed. As time it went on, it really changed. My point is things change and you can't hold on hard to the way it was before because there's a re, you can change, take advantage of it. And then here's a, an electric truck, I think, um, just to play with that picture. So I wanna talk about what I perceive as the evolution of just like a simple epidural steroid injection. And I made some fun slides uh, to simulate this. So I wanna tell you that when I started, uh, what I do, they used to do blind epidurals otherwise called landmark guided, and then fluoro guided and fluoro improved. So let me just simulate this. So the uh, character is me simulating. Uh, this is me doing a blind epidural in the closet. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and when I'm doing it, if I was to hit the nerve, my patient would tell me in black and white. As I got older, do an epidural with fluoro. In color, mind you. But if I hit the nerve, they still let me know. My fellows made me this. I don't know how to use the equipment right, you know? This is an old C arm. If you're not careful, he just got hit in the head with a C arm. He's not going to let that happen. So his co-fellow, Michael Cole, comes in. He says, we're not gonna, I'm not gonna get hit in the head. I know, I'm gonna be real careful. I'm not letting that happen. I'm gonna go into lateral. Oh, just having fun there. So uh, my point is, uh, and this is a, uh, they were joking and pretended that they were doing their hair with the fluoroscope. I don't recommend that, by the way. That's not FDA approved for that application. So the point there, this is my old floor room when I got out of fellowship, by the way. Talk about old stuff. So um, now we have improved fluoroscopy. We have, we do things, setting up a nice trajectory view, use the floor the way it's supposed to be used, place the needle, 
and the patient lays there like this with no complaints. Of course, it's not always that simple. So we use our, our book that, that, that uh, you guys were kind enough to, to show. That was our first edition, and here's me probably showing off the second edition when it came out. And um, I did want to show you um, the, the principles uh, of this book and show you some, some good stuff that we've been doing. And this is my real current passion and where it's going. I don't know if you, you use the book now that we first do a trajectory view to identify a needle path. You use multi-planar imaging to make sure we know where our needle is. We have to always know what our safety view is, which is what we don't want to hit. We confirm again with multi-planar imaging and then we put contrast in and we want to avoid suboptimal flow. So I'll just show you what I mean. By the way, this book was, is not just me alone. It was put together by many past fellows and colleagues through the years. And I was able to get them all in one place, sort of, with a little bit of Photoshop. If you can tell, there's a little bit of Photoshopping in there. So that's almost all the authors uh, of the Atlas. And I put them all in one picture uh, with the help of Dr. Patel. That's Seanak Patel. He did all the Photoshopping for this, uh, this picture. And just to share one more thing is if you really want to have fun and you look in there, Dr. Patel is in this picture three times. I uh, just want to tell you that and you can look around and I can't show you now because then you lose the fun of finding his other two pictures in there. Um, so this is the trajectory view uh, where you set up for transfer aminal, uh, the needle, and it's called trajectory because you're going to shoot down the needle in place. You're going to shoot down and bring your needle down so it's shooting down the beam. Um, the trajectory view can use for inner laminars as well. And then you'd, of course, do multi-planar imaging. It's really important that you don't have only one view because when you have only one view, it's no view. And this is a good example that one view can confuse you. And there's a picture from the internet. I didn't make that one. That see one view would have confused you. You have to get that other view so you know what's going on. And there's our icon to remind you that you need multi-planar imaging. One view is no views. The safety view is the view that confirms the needle doesn't go where you don't want it to go. Now, mind you, that's a double negative. Purposely, it's a double negative. You want the needle affirmatively to go where you do want it to go, but more importantly, you want it not to go where you don't want it to go. And that's why it's called a safety view. A good example would be a cervical inner laminar. This is a spinal cord. It would be bad to put the needle into the spinal cord stimulator, and that would be our safety view, a lateral, which is actually hard to see. So because of that, we talked about the contralateral oblique, and, uh, You'll hear a lot about it as you get into interlaminar interventions, and that's because the beam shoots down the lamina, and the needle, when it crosses the lamina, you'll see a certain view. And this is because when you do a lateral, you can't see it that well because the shoulders get in the way. But when you do a contralateral oblique, you can see the lamina, and you can see that the needle is going between the lamina. You can see the front of the lamina. This line here is called the ventral interlaminar line. And then when you put dye in, you'll see it filling up the ventral interlaminar, the interlaminar space, the epidural space right there. And so from our book, uh, this is a drawing of that same thing right there, just showing you that ventral interlaminar line. These are lamina. Some of you may look at that and say, are you sure that's the lamina, Dr. Furman? Are you really sure? Well, yes, because uh, I'll show you why. Here's a CT, 3D recon CT. And we cut the lamina on our side, digitally, we cut it away. There's the spinous process. So this is the lamina on our side of the spinous process. And look what it looks like. That's the lamina. That's what the lamina looks like if you took a CT and cut it away. And this is a part of my passion. I have a picture. I want to prove it. I sit with our CT tech and I take a picture and I just cut it away so I can duplicate that. That's kind of fun to do that kind of stuff. Anyway, and it works also in the thoracic spine. This is the lamina. This is the needle going in. That's a marker needle. And in the lumbar spine, the same thing. Uh, and you could use it for spinal cord stimulation. This is a wire going in between lamina. And this is a retrograde stimulator where the wire is going between, the needle is going between lamina here and the wire is driving down. Anyway, uh, and we, uh, because of my passion, I was asked to review an article about um, cervical epidural and whether something was um, subdural versus epidural. And uh, my fellow, Dr. Denise Norton, helped me write the uh, review. And then what happened was it became so controversial that they asked us to write a paper on it, an expert opinion. So that's where one thing leads to another, where Dr. Norton, who just helped me review an article, she got a publication out of that. So anyway, 
Um, so it's important as you're injecting, you need to know what to expect when you're injecting. That's really important, what to expect when you're injecting. And so um, I have done uh, articles about flow patterns. Um, this is differentiating um, obvious uh, uh, intrathecal flow for a myelogram versus uh, an epidural flow in a CT. That's what it would look like. And this is a subdural flow, subdural. That's intrathecal, subdural. You don't want these when you're doing an epidural. You do want this, and you have to know how to differentiate it. And we don't have time right now to, to discuss that, but we wrote an article uh, in this uh, journal uh, talking about that. Uh, I also, uh, back in the day when I had this older C arm, the same one I showed you earlier, we talked, uh, this was way back in um, uh, 2006, I wrote an article with two past fellows, three past fellows, about how to use a fluoroscopic axial and why it works uh, for discography. And what it really talks about is the fact that the disc, because of lordosis, the lumbar lordosis, the disc would be about oriented that way. So only for L5, S1 will this work, where you can actually look down the disc. Um, and that's the angles that we use to get there. And uh, we discussed that again in, in our atlas, but this is the publication, original publication. And uh, we just actually compared this fluoroscopic axial, which is in, in figures A and, and, and B. And C is a CT that goes, that correlates and just shows that in our fluoroscopic axial, we could actually get almost the same picture as the CAT scan. Mind you, this is a thin slice and this is more three-dimensionally thick, but I just want to share that with you. Now, my other passion now is to, uh, to take the same ideas that were in the red book and in the blue book, we added ultrasound. And we tried to use these icons of multi-planar view. Here's a picture of me doing a uh, Stelly Gangland block uh, in, in plane technique. And just showing you with pictures in our book uh, how the needle comes in and we drop it down to the stellar ganglion right here, avoiding the carotid artery, uh, jugular vein, et cetera. And I'm just showing you the same principles are uh, to make sure you're being safe and know what you're trying to avoid when you do these pictures. Um, and then this is the uh, hybrid uh, floral confirmation of that same sympathetic block, different angle. Um, you could also do cervical medial branch blocks under ultrasound and we've been doing that. This is Paul in. Uh, my, my, my colleague Paul showing that with uh, one of my past fellows from the book. Uh, and again, we put a drawing here and show why it works. And this is an out of plane technique. Uh, and this is simulating where the uh, ultrasound uh, head is. And again, the blue book tries to make it as simple as possible, making all these pictures correlate with each other. So it's kind of fun to not only do these procedures, but figure out how to properly teach them to people. And these are just more pictures saying the same thing. Um, and how to confirm it. Um, one of my other passions is the transitional segments. Is would, would you call this L5? Would you call this S1? And we wrote an article about this. And one of my past fellows, who's now my partner, helped me write this article. And that's another passion and we don't have time to get into that. Um, it's very important that you understand your dye patterns. This is a live dye pattern under digital subtraction. And you can see how pretty that looks. That's a cervical transforaminal. So that's kind of understand what, what to look for. That's an ideal. And then here's a subtle uh, intravascular injection. Uh, and if you look really hard, you can see the blood vessel. Yeah, it's subtle, isn't it? Uh, but you have to be able to recognize that. That's why you need to do live flow. And we would call that suboptimal, okay? Um, so we have a study based on all these interests is that um, I did years ago, back in 2000, uh, one of my first articles that talked about the rate of intravascular injections was 11.2%, it's higher for S1s. But if you pull back on your syringe and aspirate, it's only, it's less than 50% sensitive for finding that blood vessel. We did that in the lumbar spine, and uh, we also did that in the cervical spine. And again, uh, similar results in the sense that um, pulling back on the syringe was only uh, less than 50% sensitive. So you have to really do live fluoro, that's the bottom line of that, okay? And uh, so that's, that's the goal there. We also, uh, in our atlas, talk about um, spine masquerators. The, here's a picture of the hip, hip injection, and I older some guy a hip injection, and just showing you we use the same principles of teaching it. Um, and here is an article I'm actually in the midst of writing right now. It's not out yet. And uh, it's a really high level thing that if you don't do cervical RF or cervical medial branch blocks, you won't understand the challenges of the procedure 
but this is just simulating an RF needle in a 3D uh, CT scan. Your needle has to be here. The C arm uh, actually shoots through the neural foramen. So that's why it's called a contralateral oblique. In this case, it's a different reason it's a CLO. It's not a CLO because of the lamina, which is here. It's a CLO because you're shooting down the foramen. And um, so you have to identify in your fluoro what the foramen looks like. And um, I can't spend a lot of time with that, but I just want to make sure you understand that's why this works. But there's another view called the off lateral, the contralateral view, which is the off lateral. It's not as steep, and it's really helpful for separating the two joints out. And here's the two joints being separated. And there's the needle in the more posterior joint. And I just gave a lecture for SIS, uh, and I'm showing that here, um, where I'm talking about how these split. So I'm trying to show here to see our moving live. I'm trying to teach the video live. What I'm doing is showing these two Z joints splitting with a live video. So watch, I'm showing that here where I'm gonna bring them together now and watch the fluoro angle while I do it. I'm trying to show with a live video how you separate, how you separate the two Z joints and how you bring them together. And I'm trying to make sure I, I clarify that point. So the point I'm just trying to show there, this is my new passion and many of you on this phone call, on the Zoom, know that I've been doing a lot of live Zoom lectures and that's my passion is to now be able to go live with fluoro and live uh, imaging and teach these things, not just with static imaging, but to create videos to teach these things. So here's some more screenshots from our live Zoom where I have a hand cam here, which will let you see me drive my needle here, me spinning the C-arm, and this is just me showing medial branch block RF and intra-articular facet. And then I'm trying to correlate these same pictures here with our atlas. So they all work out. So it's really important that we understand as I'm showing you all this technology, we have to use it fully, but don't do it stupidly. So anyway, uh, that's going back to the original picture of the Hummer or whatever. So anyway, so you may ask, how do we safely and efficiently perform these different musculoskeletal procedures? Well, it depends. And again, I want to credit my, my co-authors from the uh, Atlas E2 who have really helped me with that. So moving on, I have more questions. Uh, how do we do these efficiently and safely? How much injectate should we use? You know, you walk into a room, you're, you're, you're a student or a resident, and you walk into your attending and you say, how much volume should I put in my syringe? And they say, that's a good question. Well, how would you answer that question? Well, you need to know what volumes we use for a procedure. And our first time I asked that was, I had a question, is it really possible? I don't like the expression selective nerve root block because, and I wrote an article about this, the nerve root is right here. It changes names as, it, as, it, as, it, as it's the frame, and right here it's called the spinal nerve. The spinal nerve, and then it splits into the ventral and dorsal ramus. Again, this is the, just right here is the nerve root, and uh, I'm just showing you that because it's important because what's the word selective? If you're injecting out here and you're selective, meaning it doesn't go to any levels, I want to show you when the dye goes in here, it goes out a different level. That's not selective. So if you're out here, you're selective, but that's not a nerve root. It's a spinal nerve. So you can't do a selective nerve root block. That would be a selective spinal nerve block. If you're in here and the dye goes all over in here and it comes out the side above, it's not selective. So I wrote that and that prompted me, one question leads to another, to actually do a study, uh, and I published it in 08, trying to answer that question. And we saw that even 0.5 was consistently non-selective and could not be reliably used. That, study led me to um, another one where we started to figure out we wanted to as i'm doing that i realized that another question is what volumes do you need to reach a specific landmark so we broke out these landmarks is what volume and transferaminal would it take to get up to the level above or the level below or just get to this pedicle here so we graphed these cumulative volumes and we identified that um to get to the uh, superior intervertebral disc which is pink uh, almost 100% of the time, four, four cc's would get there, maybe three. Uh, inferior, similar volume, but if you wanted both superior and inferior, uh, it would, you'd have to put about three 
for, and it's still not 100% of the time. So that's why it's almost better to look at your, look at your dye pattern before you decide what volumes to put in. Uh, we did the same article for S1 with similar data, and we identified that it takes two and a half to three to get it 80 to 100% of the time. So what volumes should you use for procedure? You know what the answer is, everybody? It depends. Okay, so are epidurals efficacious? And uh, here's an article where we, um, we uh, did a pilot study um, for epidural steroid injections, and bottom line is uh, we, anyway, so uh, we're, it, 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 it was just a pilot study. So now you might ask, you know, what, what is the perfect inject tape? What is the secret sauce? Let's take a deep breath. Changing the subject a little, what is the secret sauce? This is a big topic now because in regenerative medicine, people are talking about all sorts of PRP, platelet-rich, platelet-poor, platelet lysate, all these different stuff. There's a, we were involved with the Biostat fibrin sequence interdiscal study. We were also involved with the Cascade adult stem cell study. These are all trying to find that secret sauce. And I would submit that maybe not in my lifetime, but in your lifetime, we will find some secret sauce that's gonna help the disc get better. There's various studies, but they're nothing definitive. So I wanna let you know that we will probably soon figure out what these secret sauces are, but the fact that insurance isn't paying for them is proving to you that there's nothing proven yet to be the secret sauce that we're gonna inject into the disc. So let's talk about the secret sauce a little more. Let's talk about secret sauce, sexy versus not sexy. Sexy is intradiscal steroid. Or, I'm sorry, intradiscal secret sauce. That's sexy. It's cool. You place a needle, you put the stuff in there, patients hopefully get better. Let's get back to basics. We still need to, as physiatrists, teach our patients proper biomechanics. We do need to cover the four pillars of health for these people. We do need to make sure we're covering diet and nutrition. Exercise. Remember, motion is the lotion, or as Sir Isaac Newton said, a body in motion stays in motion. We need to decrease people's stress and they need to get sleep. That all sounds easy to say. But if you walk into every patient and you said, I want to ask you four things. How is your diet? You would change a lot of people's lives, but a lot of people don't want to hear it. It's more work to do that. That's not sexy. Prevention isn't sexy. It's hard. But that's what we need to keep in mind. So now I will take uh, a few slides and just do some pearls before I move on and finish. Uh, a moral compass. We need to have a moral compass. Uh, you can always think of someone that you look up to or be it a religious person, uh, someone uh, spiritual, and ask yourself, what would so-and-so do? Someone who's one of your past mentors. You can wear a wrist bracelet on your, that says, what would so-and-so do? But you need to have that in your mind as you're about to do something on a patient, to a patient, in life in general. And you should always be asking yourself, what would so-and-so do? And that will give you the answer of what the right thing to do would be. Then there's the Yo Mama rule. That was stolen from Dr. Dreyfus. That's my mom with my 24-year-old daughters when they were born. Um, the Mama rule is real simple. If you're about to do something, you have to ask yourself, would you do this procedure or would you do this on your mama? And, if the, and that's assuming you love your mama, by the way. And if you love your mama and you wouldn't do it on your mama, don't do it on a patient, okay? Setup is key, I told you that. It's in many venues, not just epidurals and procedures and interventions. It's in our practices, our encounters with patients and staff, et cetera. Make sure you understand the science behind what we do. Use up-to-date terminology and semantics, know the literature and understand the technology. I'd like to take a second. There's a famous book by Stephen Covey, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He talks about sharpening the saw expression. What it really means is I have to, it's, you have to tell a story. The guy's cutting wood. As he's cutting the wood, he's got a big pile next to him. And someone comes by and says to him, hey, dude, did you sharpen your saw? And he goes, I can't. I don't have time. I can't. Have to, I don't have any time to sharpen my saw. Look at all this wood I got to cut. But I can assure you, if you took the time and sharpened the saw, it'd be a lot more efficient. So sharpen the saw means a lot of things. It means make sure you take the time and read. Make sure you read the chart before you walk into a patient's room. That's all sharpening the saw. So sharpen the saw, uh, be an Olympic ice skater. And this is key. It's not what happens, it's how you deal with it. And I like to say that because, think about this, something bad happens in the day and I can tell about it through a past fellow. 
And something bad happened. I gave him crap about it. And then he moves on to the next patient. He's not concentrating. I said, what are you doing, man? And he says, I'm really sorry about that last patient. I said, move on, move on. The reason I say it's like an Olympic ice skater, think about this. You ever notice those Olympic ice skaters, when they fall, they get right back up and they keep going? They don't do that in a lot of sports, but they definitely do it in Olympic ice skating. And man, you, you know they fell. And you know what's going through their mind, man. They know they lost the gold because they fell. They get right back up. Think of that. It's not what happens to you. It's how you deal with it. Stuff, bad stuff happens. And how people respond to the bad stuff is more important than anything else. And you have to create raving fans. I told you about this. Um, I told you about tell people what to expect, tell them what to ex not to expect. I want to share with you, um, there's a famous philosopher. I have actually a, an audio file of this famous philosopher telling this a different way. So the point of that is you can't always get what you want, but if you try sometime, you'll get what you need, as Mick Jagger said. And that's, you can use for a lot of situations. So I told you already, tell people what to expect, tell them what not to expect. So um, you have to have vision. And I've been talking about that. Um, years back, I read this article uh, from the um, uh, Harvard Review about big, hairy, audacious goals. And Sony in the 50s, they said they wanted to become a country. Back when I was a kid in the 50s and 60s, uh, Jet Made in Japan meant crap. And Sony back in the 50s just said they want to become a company most known for changing the worldwide poor quality image for Japanese products. And uh, they came out with the Walkman. And I don't need to tell you what Sony has now. Um, and that's just it. They had a big, hairy, audacious goal. Uh, don't be too crazy in your goals, of course, but be realistic. Uh, when I gave my first lecture, I showed you when I was in Hawaii, my kids were younger. I put this slide up. I said, physiatrist, that was my goal. Big, hairy, audacious goal. The physiatrists should be known as the premier spine care researchers. They should dominate neuromusculoskeletal care. The practices of physiatry should be the strongest in their respective communities. And the physiatrists in all multi-specialty groups should be at least true equals. And we achieved that. So that was a big, hairy, audacious goal of mine at one point. You also have to have a big, hairy, audacious goal personal. And I'll tell you, I'm not going to tell you mine. So this was a lecture. This was a, this was a sign I saw when I was camp, uh, hiking with my daughters and my wife. I don't know what that means. End of trail. Very interesting. So I guess we're kind of near the end of the trail. I don't know what that means, but I will say that you got to keep going. So I won the Legacy Award. Um, I, I thought about what legacy means is we've achieved something that continues to exist even after we stop working. And I think that's pretty cool. So I'd like to believe I've done that. So hopefully I've made you all think about things today. And remember, it depends. Uh, just remember, it depends. Um, so my past fellows and you guys are our future. And so my legacy, I'm leaving my, my contributions and my past fellows are going to become our future uh, in academia and in clinical. The quality of our lives are determined by the people we meet, the books we read, and the questions we ask. This is a picture from one of our, our courses that we had a couple of years ago in our office for residents. Um, so my, I'd like to believe the patients I've met, the research contributions by past fellows in the future, Kate, past fellows in the future and the publications and books are my legacy, I hope. And I just want to end with one thing and I'm going to answer questions for you. Is that I don't always have the answers, but when I do, I prefer it depends. And that's uh, how I'll finish this. And that's my last slide. So thank you very much. I'll stop sharing and I open it up for questions. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Furman. It was excellent. Uh, I'm, really sorry, I went over. I'm 10 minutes over. I apologize. For that. No, no, no. There's no limit here. It was fantastic. Really appreciated. Uh, we are very honored and, uh, and pleased to uh, have you uh, discuss all your knowledge uh, with us. Um, if you do have any questions, you can uh, post on the chat box and I can read back to Dr. Furman. I think that's the best way to keep it organized. Or if you do have access, Dr. Furman, you can look at the chat box, but I can help you with that. All right. I mean, I'll look at the chat box and I can handle that. I am somewhat technical, so. All right. Looks like it's a bunch of thank yous so far. You're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, and you're welcome. 
Yeah, so one person did ask about the access to the videos that you were discussing that I think it's part of your uh, series with your book. Yeah, I'm still trying to work out some copyright issues um, because I, I don't own all the pictures in the book and um, I'm not sure where we're gonna go with it right now. Um, we'll see where it goes. I might have, I may eventually create a channel on uh, YouTube or Vimeo for them uh, and I'm, I'm working on that now, but I need permission to do that. Also, the original videos didn't have the quality I like. I'm just slowly evolving and they're a little choppy, I'm trying to get them cleaned up. But eventually, hopefully, I hope to do that. There are many thank yous, but no question. I think everyone, uh, you know, was very impressed, of course, as we expected. and. Uh, very pleased, thank you. All right, well, thank you, everybody. And um, I will tell you, um, for now, and I apologize, because this does have an East Coast bias right now. Um, we will resume them again. Right now, we have new fellows. Um, my goal is to continue doing some of these early morning, Friday morning uh, uh, videos, and we are doing them uh, on Friday mornings at 6.30 a.m. EST, Eastern time. So I really apologize to you West Coasters because that's pretty damn early. Uh, or even mid, mid Coasters, uh, mid, mid, Midwestern, mid et cetera. But um, we are, I'm trying to figure out a way I can release those videos, like at least for three days after we do it so that people can watch them. But we're still trying to work out some detail. But for now, we only have live and they would be they're Zoom lectures. Um, and, um, Anyway, uh, I see, do you have any fellow workshops coming this year? No, well, I mean, we had one this year. Oh, fellow workshops, no. We did have resident workshops um, and we had to cancel this year because of COVID. I'm sure you've heard of COVID. Um, and uh, I don't, we, we don't really have any fellow workshops because it's just a little overwhelming. Um, we can't do it all, um, so. So we'll, we'll, but that's why we're just kind of doing the Zoom lectures so we can reach more people, so. Well, thanks a lot. Yeah, I've been, uh, I've had the pleasure to join some of your early morning lectures. I'm in the Midwest, but it's still, you know, 5.30, I'm getting my breakfast and uh, getting some learning on early in the morning. So that was excellent. And uh, we can certainly, uh, uh, you know, have you over again and, and get you some of the, uh, you can hopefully go over some of your procedures as well. And as uh, I know we had that discussion before and uh, I'm sure we're gonna have a great turnout with uh, more people interested in, in going over your procedures and we can certainly arrange an early morning lecture for that as well, if it's interest of the group as well. Right, um, I see one, one gentleman uh, did comment in the com here about um, a little confusion. I, I did wanna show you some basic stuff as well as some advanced stuff. So I apologize if I overwhelmed you with the more, advanced uh, contralateral oblique and things like that. But that's something you will eventually know if you become a spine doctor. Uh, and uh, so I, it's, but I want to make sure you understand. I want to show you all, all extent of my interest to so the simple stuff to the advanced. And I try to be very pragmatic in most, most of the things I, I'm passionate about. Um, so that's why a lot of times it comes up with a question that I'm pondering on. That's kind of how it, these things evolve. So anyway, but thank you everybody. Well, we, we thank you. It was excellent. And uh, we hope to have you again sometime. And uh, it was fantastic. I hope everybody buys your book because not because, uh, you know, it's, it's the best book I have and I got to get the second copy, you know, the blue, which is my favorite color. So it is really a fantastic book. And uh, we really appreciate um, all your time and your effort, you know, not only teaching us, but for the profession, for everything that you have done. We appreciate your wisdom and sharing your words. It was excellent. Um, so thank you very much for, you know, spending an hour and a half here with us. We really appreciate that. I know we are, I know you were very busy. Thanks for letting me share this lecture. Obviously it took a lot of time to make it, so I'm happy to share it. So thank you everybody. Thanks for joining. Well, Thanks for sharing my passions. Well, we thank you again. Just a, final, just a final message here with PMNR scholars for those that are on the call for the first time and you are not familiar with our group. Really, we um, are just a group of students, residents, uh, early career uh, fellows and uh, physiatrists that we connected through social media uh, originally and now evolved with, during the COVID time utilizing Zoom platforms and go-to meetings and other platforms like that to connect the field with um, 
you know, all over um, the United States and across the world, actually, we had some people with a comment here in the presentation today that we had some uh, audience from Iran, from uh, Morocco, and things like that. So we are just very happy to have, you know, everybody join us. And uh, the goal of our group is to provide a free um, environment so everybody can learn and can share wisdom and can share uh, just constructive ideas like Dr. Foreman mentioned, we are really trying to push the envelope to, uh, you know, just expand and kind of get involved and uh, not only establish something that, you know, hopefully we can see in the next few years continuing just, uh, you know, as the new students come over and new residents, uh, we certainly want uh, this group to continue to promote a connection between the students, the residents, the fellows and the early career physiatrists as well. So uh, that's the mission of our group. If you want to learn more about it, it's free. And uh, we are also doing a virtual residency fair that all the students can join. Our website is pmrscholars.org and you can join there. And um, if you sign up with your email and that's all you need, you will receive the link with all the information um, with our upcoming lectures, educational lectures, as well as our virtual residency fair that we are uh, doing. We have about 60 or so programs in the entire country that are doing a uh, 20 minute presentation about uh, their program um, for the upcoming match. So if you have any questions, go to pmnrscholars.org. And I'll just echo what you said is that I just want to let you know that I, to this day, still have friends uh, and colleagues that I am in touch with that I worked with um, from around the country when I was in the resident physician council. Same idea is it's it's really cool to to meet people from around to, uh, that get out of your get out of your local environment and meet people who are as interested in you and as, as in, and, and enthused as yourselves and meet other folks doing what you're doing and uh, you can develop some really long term relationships. Uh, the more you give, the more you get. Just keep that in mind, whether it be with PMR scholars or even the resident physician that physicians in training of the academy. So uh, just uh, get involved and uh, the more you put in, the more you'll get out of this stuff. And so. I want to echo what Vinny is saying there. So, Thank you very much. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. Have a good evening, and uh, we'll see you next time.